In my last video, I repaired a budget focus board, the FIC486 VCHD. Had a dead Dallas RTC module, which is very common, but it also suffered from really high memory latency. Went down a rabbit hole of troubleshooting and uncovered a write back caching issue that impacted many 486 boards from that era. But after adding an SRAM chip for Alter RAM, it finally started performing up to par. Even though I saw some nice gains, really couldn't help but wonder how much more I could squeeze out of the system. But I wanted to approach today's video from the perspective of a budget conscious consumer back in 1992. I wanted to see just how far I could take this system without having to swap out hardware and spend any significant amount of money. This board has a soldered on Intel 46 SX25 with stepping code SX683. The QFP chips have a plastic top instead of a ceramic top like the PGA versions, which is significant because it limits its total design power. Plastic obviously doesn't dissipate heat as well as a thick layer of ceramic, and this also probably means that the core is built on Intel's later 800 nanometer process, the same used for much higher clocked parts, and very good for our overclocking prospects. Now you'd think that overclocking a 486 would be a simple matter of, you know, just switch the jumper from 25 to 33 and away you go. Many later 486 boards have frequency generator chips that can be set with a variety of frequencies using jumpers, but some older 486 and 386 boards don't have these, so instead the bus speed is derived from a single crystal oscillator that's installed in a socket on the board, and these are often referred to as crystal cans. On many boards, these crystals are actually double the CPU frequency. So in this case, a 50 megahertz crystal is used for a 25 megahertz bus and CPU frequency. And that's because the board uses a frequency divider. You'll also notice that there is often a zip tie around the crystal can. Some people have speculated that this was to discourage overclocking. So a computer shop would know if it was cut off, but I really don't think that's the case. The cans only have four very small pins. They don't really sit very securely in the socket. So these are really just there to make sure that they stay put. Nonetheless, I've affectionately called these the forbidden zip ties. I've got a couple of additional ones here. One is 66 megahertz and the other is 80. Perfect for the standard bus speeds of 33 and 40 megahertz respectively. One thing to keep in mind is that when we increase the bus speed, we're also gonna be increasing the frequency of the memory and L2 cache, which is an awesome side benefit so long as the chips can handle it. This board has 20 nanosecond rated SRAM in it and 70 nanosecond rated SIMS. Should be just fine for 33 megahertz, possibly 40 with some tweaks, but we'll have to see. The ISA bus frequency is also derived from the front side bus frequency using a different divider. This one can be adjusted in the BIOS though. So as we increase the front side bus frequency, we'll also need to adjust this one if we wanna keep it in spec. And last but not least, there is the question of whether the chipset itself can handle higher bus speeds. Some can't, but I know that the VT82C495 can handle at least 40 megahertz because there are versions of this board used with 40 megahertz AMD 386 CPUs. Before I adjust anything, I'm gonna add a super sophisticated cooling solution to this CPU. I know that looks super sketchy, but these are nothing like modern day CPUs and really this 50 millimeter heatsink is completely overkill. It'll keep it safe, but potentially give us some better overclocking headroom too. Okay, let's see if this SX25 can handle 33 megahertz. No, it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's still a pretty substantial 32% to overclock. Just a quick tip before removing the old crystal, make note of its orientation in the socket. There is a little dot on the corner to help with this. If you put it in backwards, they will begin to heat up very quickly and bad things will happen. All right, so boot it up just fine. I'm gonna go into the BIOS and set the proper ISA bus divider to keep it at around eight megahertz. I'm also leaving all of the cache and memory weight states to zero as it should be able to handle that just fine at 33 megahertz. Nice bonus of having an upgrade socket on the board is that the clock pin location is easily accessible for use with a scope. As you can see, we are indeed running at 33.3 megahertz. I know I've been running a lot of Doom time demos lately, but it really is an excellent stability test. In my experience, if your CPU and or memory is unstable, Doom will crash out pretty quickly and let you know. I also like to run Memtest 86 Plus. Any version older than 4.10 should work just fine on older 386 and 486 systems. And yeah, looks like it's working perfectly fine. See some nice improvements in memory and L2 cache performance too, thanks to the higher bus speed. And I'll share some more benchmark results in a bit, so stay tuned. Okay, 33 megahertz seemed like a walk in the park for this system, so let's take it to the next level and try 40 megahertz. 
Interesting side note, Intel never released any 486s based on a 40 MHz bus speed. AMD and Cyrix both took advantage of this fact and had numerous 40 MHz models that competed with similarly priced Intel 33 MHz parts. Nice, looks like it's booting up. Honestly wasn't sure if it would, but let's see if it's stable. I think it's frozen up. It's not getting past that wait message. And I'm pretty sure it would let us wait here forever, I think. So after some back and forth, I was able to get the system totally stable by increasing the cache read wait state to one, as well as setting the memory wait state to one. Now it's unfortunate we lost some memory performance from the wait states, but that is a massive 60% overclock. Doom is running noticeably smoother now too. I'm able to get about 6,000 real ticks or around 12.4 frames per second. 40 megahertz is already super impressive, but we're obviously not gonna stop here. I don't have any faster crystals, unfortunately, but I did a bit of digging and discovered an interesting feature. All that's needed is to move the two jumpers labeled JK1 and JK2, and then you have a one-to-one -one crystal to bus frequency. This means I can just reinstall the original 50 megahertz crystal and get a 50 megahertz bus speed. Now 50 megahertz is gonna be a bit of a stretch, that's for sure, that's a 100% overclock, but we do know that Intel's 486 cores could reach 50 and even 66 megahertz by late 1992. Obviously Intel did binning even back then, but you just really never know with the silicon lottery, that's for sure. Anyway, the moment of truth, let's see if it boots. Yes, indeed it does, but yeah, looks like it's frozen up at the wait screen again. So I did some testing and I was able to get the system to boot finally. I did need to further loosen up the cache wait states, needed both the cache read and write wait state set to one. But, and I have no idea why, but at a 50 megahertz bus speed, the RAM works just fine at a zero wait state. If I boot up the system at 40, it doesn't, even after numerous attempts. So I can only assume that there are some hidden sub timings that are not visible in the BIOS that change based on the system's bus speed. So even though the cache is looser, the memory should see a big boost at a zero wait state. I've run through three Doom time demo loops now, and it has not missed a beat, so I'm very pleasantly surprised, and this thing just works great at 50 megahertz. Next, I did what any reasonable person would do. I pushed the system even further. I took the 66 megahertz crystal and attempted to run it with the board's divider off, but not surprisingly, the system showed no signs of life at all. Didn't matter how loose I set the cache and memory, I don't think it's likely the chipset could handle that frequency at all. But for now, I'll settle for 50 megahertz, a 100% overclock. All right, so you know me, I like a good set of charts. Here we go. Let's start with the good old system information CPU benchmark. This one is all about CPU integer performance. Cache and memory don't really play much of a role here and we see very linear gains as the CPU frequency increases. The score literally doubled between 25 and 50 megahertz. Looking at 3D Bench 1.0C, we see some substantial gains going from 25 to 50 megahertz, from 15.8 all the way up to 24.5 frames per second. As expected, the gain from 33 to 40 megahertz was a bit smaller, and that's due to the extra weight states required there. And of course, it wouldn't be a 486 video without Doom benchmarks. I've included Fast Doom results here too. Check out the description if you'd like to learn more about Fast Doom. The gains here may not be as dramatic as what you see with the synthetic CPU benchmarks, as there are some other things holding Doom back, but I will talk more about this in a bit. Nonetheless, we still went from 9.8 up to just shy of 14 frames per second, which is a nice 40% gain. And looking at the cache check latency scores, you can see some nice improvements as the bus speed increases. L1 latency is cut in half thanks to the CPU clock. L2 and memory latency also benefit a lot from the increased bus speed. Would have been even more impressive if we had better rated cache and didn't need the wait states. And at 33 megahertz, it actually outperforms the 40 megahertz result, again, because we had to add that extra RAM wait state for some reason there. Memory throughput's also looking so much better. Without the Alter RAM, it was a pokey 8.3 megabytes per second, which improved to 13 with it installed. But as the bus speed increased, the throughput went up considerably, all the way up to 22 megabytes per second at a 50 megahertz clock. Really nice. A 50 megahertz 486 CPU is basically top of the line levels of performance in 1992. But there's one thing really holding it back, especially when it comes to gaming. And that's the fact that this board only has 16 bit ISA slots. The CPU is ready and willing, but that Glacial 8MHz ISA bus just holds it back really badly. 
and that's why you see less than impressive gains in both Doom and 3D Bench as the CPU speed increases. This is why Visa Local Bus was such a big deal when it came to 46 gaming. Now obviously we're stuck with ISA on this system, and even if we upgraded to a faster ISA graphics card, the gains would be pretty small. But there's nothing stopping us from overclocking the ISA bus and running it out of spec. Being able to do this obviously depends a lot on the ISA cards that you have installed in the system. Most cards don't have a problem with small increases to 10 or even 12 megahertz, but going beyond that though is definitely way out of spec. I adjusted the ISA bus divider and had no issues at all up to 12.5 megahertz and saw some really nice increases in Doom. I pushed it to a one and one half divider and again, no issues at 16.7 megahertz for a 100% overclock of the ISA bus. I did try to push it further, but looks like the big jump to 25 megahertz was just way too spicy. I did, however, have some success at 40 megahertz with a 20 megahertz ISA bus speed, but that's really the limits of what these cards can do. But things really started to change when I went to install a sound card. Video card and multi-IO card seem to work just fine at 16.7 megahertz, but trying to find a sound card that's totally happy at that frequency is not easy. My Sound Blaster CT2800 worked perfectly fine at 12.5, but at 16.7, start to hear some clicking noises out of one of the channels and some other oddities. But I also found that the system overall was just a bit flaky and unstable with some random hangs occurring. There were some really nice gains by increasing the ISA bus frequency, even by just a little bit. For really graphically demanding games, this could be just as effective as overclocking the CPU, really. Doubling the ISA bus frequency increased our frame rate in Doom by almost 30%, and Fast Doom saw even larger gains at closer to 40. Now we really have doubled our performance in Doom compared to the non-overclocked configuration. 3D Bench also benefits from the faster ISA bus, managing over 30 frames per second, again almost doubling the score compared to the non-overclocked 25MHz setup. What an incredible overclock. That's a 100% overclock of the CPU, 100% overclock of the front side bus, memory, and cache, combined with a 100% overclock of the ISA bus. That's just something unheard of in modern times. If you look at the top of the line systems available in 1992, you'll see that the DX2s hadn't really hit the market much, and the DX50 was the CPU of choice for high end systems. That chip was more than five times the cost of the SX25. Granted, the SX didn't have an FPU, but for the average consumer, it wouldn't really have mattered much at that time. The 486 SX series was an important product that really made 486s accessible to the budget PC market. They were a big improvement over the aging 386s that were used in cheaper PCs at that time. You may have noticed that I tend to give names to my retro projects, and I think this one is definitely worthy of one. Since I was able to fix the caching issue with Alter RAM and it overclocks like a beast, I think the Altered Beast 486 would be an appropriate name. Let me know what you think. Anyway, that's it for today. There will be one final video featuring this board that I'm hoping to release soon. Should be an interesting one, so stay tuned for that. Thanks very much for watching. If you enjoy my channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. And as always, you can find more information and useful links in the description below.